Thank you. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here today to introduce Sonny. Um, Sonny's an amazing individual, so you all know he's president and CEO of AES, uh, formerly a principal at Stantec as well. Um, youngest associate at uh, Anthony uh, Seaman as well. But you know what I really admire about Sonny is uh, what we at View like to call seeing possibilities. So, for those of you that don't know, what we do at View Glass is we really live at the intersection between comfort, health, and well-being, smart and connected, and energy and sustainability. So we see these trends existing. And the industry is, from our perspective, is ripe for disruption for companies that develop products and technologies and solutions that address those trends. Occupants are getting smarter, they're demanding better. We all want technology that makes our life better. That's why we're all here. Technology should make our life better. So many people have called view disruptive because we are doing something in the glass industry that's never been done before. But for us, it's really about seeing possibility, seeing technology that can make our lives better. And so when I hear the word disruption, I actually get really excited. It's about creating something better. It's about innovating. Again, it's about that person and how do we make them and the world a better place. So, you know, Sunny has done some amazing work, over 100 lead projects, living building projects, three of them. And so what I'm really excited about today is to learn Sonny's take on how he sees the industry evolving, because from my perspective, we are just right at the cusp of major changes within our industry. So please join me in welcoming Sonny Katora and his presentation. Thank you. Is a new trick for a robot. Congratulations. Respond. What does this action signify? As you entered, when you looked at the other human, what does it mean? It's a sign of trust. It's a human thing. You wouldn't understand. My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are difficult. You mean you're a designer? Yes. So why'd you murder him? I did not murder Dr. Lanning. Want to explain why you were hiding at the crime scene? I was frightened. Robots don't feel fear. They don't feel anything. They don't get hungry. They don't sleep. I do. I have even had dreams. Human beings have dreams. Even dogs have dreams, but not you. You are just a machine, an imitation of life. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? I think you murdered him because he was teaching you to simulate emotions and things got out of control. I did not murder him. I mean, but emotions don't seem like a very useful simulation for a robot. I did not murder him. What the hell, I don't want my toaster or my vacuum cleaner appearing emotional. I did not murder him! Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Before we get started, if we can take our noise-making devices and put it on a non-noise-making mode, that would be great. I thought I'd start with that video. Anybody seen that movie? Show of hands. Excellent. When was the movie out? Sorry? A while ago. What's a while ago? A while ago in tech business means uh, two weeks ago. So let's define a while ago. It was 12 to 14 years ago that that movie came out. When it first came out, we looked at it, I saw it, 
Ah, cool, techie. And what I've done since then is I watch that movie every two years. And there's sessions and there's clips within the movie that I bookmark mentally and physically. And what I've noticed over the past four years is some of, the, some of the technology has been adopted slowly. And over the last four years, we're now seeing an exponential curve in adoption of just about everything in that movie, with the exception of Walking Talking Sunny, which was the robot, and the autonomous vehicle. So when I look at technology, and everybody talks about technology, we have approximately 50, maybe 60 members in the audience. We have probably 50 or 60 smart devices. If I were to guess accurately, we have 50 people in the audience and we have 100 smart devices. Because each of you have two of everything. You've got a smartphone and a tablet. You've got a smartphone and a Fitbit. You've got a smartphone and something, something, something. There's at least three or four chargers that have nothing to do with your workstation at your workstation. We can all relate to that. That has changed the way we live our lives. And if you look at the iPhone, which is what started all of it, the iPhone first came out in... We're trying to wake you up. I've been up since four, because that's when my day starts, and I think this group, some start that early, some not so much. When did the iPhone come out? Smartphones. 2006. 2006. That was the biggest change in our lives. Before that was the Industrial Revolution, before that was planes, and before that was... Trends. Automobiles. 1911, 1913. Automobiles changed the way the world worked. The reason we have traffic light systems is because the only two cars on the road end up colliding with each other and they say, oh, we better put some systems in to block people from hitting each other. That's how traffic management systems started in the uh, 20s. So if you look at technology, the next big disruption that I see is autonomous, and we can call it a vehicle, we can call it anything you want, autonomous anything. It could be an autonomous building. We talk about view glass. View glass, actually, I love because what it does is it lets light in and keeps the glare out. Uh, that's autonomous because it works with art artificial intelligence and then responds to the people within the building. That is the next five years that's going to disrupt our entire lives. Uh, whether you're here in the first world or out in the third world. And it's going to move very, very fast. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, a bit, before we get into it, I'll talk a little bit about AES, a bit about what we do. Uh, if, you, if you're working on a project and there's anything that carries a pulse, be it wired or wireless, we get involved with it. So, we're a DIP 26, 27, 28 firm. I get tired of naming all the services, so what I say is we do electrical, we do lighting, we do um, ICT, information and communication technology, and we do other stuff as well, including uh, other services that we started offering. We started the practice in 2001. We've got four offices, a presence in Victoria, Vancouver, Calgary, and we just opened Edmonton in uh, March. Uh, why? Well, I know we're crazy. So we opened in March in Edmonton. We're now four offices, about 90 people strong, and we service everything in Western Canada, Eastern, and uh, some uh, international projects as well. Some of the things we get involved in, architectural lighting, uh, AV and security and, and, and uh, the information technology design. And the one shift that needs to occur, and I should have asked this at the beginning, do we have any architects in the room? Two? Three? Great! I didn't expect any architects in this room. I used to be part of the group ten years ago and, and then we got busy with other things. The way we do design typically is we start with the programming, we work with the owner, then we get into the built environment, we move blocks and pieces around, we layer in structure, engineering, and then the after piece is always technology. Always, always, always ends with technology defined by how many dollars we have left after we deal with the ff &E budget. If it sounds familiar, you know what I'm talking about. If not, uh, that process is going to change completely. Because what we are doing on projects now is starting with technology, because when I use technology, we can remove things like doors. We can remove things like the five or six sensors that you have on the wall as you walk into a room because we can integrate it with devices and use lighting to actually communicate with the rest of the built environment. Uh, the other thing, sustainability, I won't talk about. But the very last one, if there is a code written in North America, CSA, ULC, NBC, and I'm not going to name them all. They're, they're quite boring and lengthy. Uh, we either authored it, we chair it, 
we write it or we interpret it for the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, we're currently a consultant to all AHJ in BC and in Alberta for any type of standard that you want. So when you go in on a project and the, the uh, authority is unclear on the interpretation, they go back, they make a phone call, they call us. And then between myself and a group of five or six other individuals, we consult on what the interpretation is. And I'm sure everybody here has a copy of the Canadian Electrical Code because it's such a riveting document. If you have a look at it right at the top, we've authored the book, so I proudly say we, we, we've written the code. Uh, this is a project, if you're not familiar with it, this is in uh, Penticton. It was designed in 2009, opened in 2011. The utility meter on the building goes in reverse. We actually have reduced the carbon footprint off the campus by constructing a new 80,000 square foot trade building. Go figure that. So we've reduced the greenhouse gas emissions and the carbon output. This is a 65 kilowatt hour per meter square building for anybody that works in the uh, sustainable uh, uh, footprint. Of course, we've got PV, that's how we get to that number. And then the other one is uh, the recent trades building in Kelowna. This is a 74 kilowatt hour building as well. So why I put these up, when people talk about net zero and regenerative and, and lead platinum and a lot of these energy intensive buildings consuming low energy and talk about it not being a possibility, they don't know what they're doing. You're actually doing it wrong. And using technology, you can save a lot of that. And so we've been doing this for a while now. Some of the other things I, I put up, some of the awards that we won recently on lighting, Student Union Building, the Guilford Aquatic Center. Uh, the other one is the Canada Post Processing Plant. I was the lead design for that, and I think we're going to tour this group out there um, uh, next month. So look forward to that one. What does anybody think when they see this, other than I want to work there? What do you see when you see that? It's a great office. Sorry? No paper. No paper. Yeah. So it must be a designer's office. No paper at all. No windows. It's actually not a picture, it's a rendering. It's such a good rendering, we've got the reflection of the screen on the white behind there with the glossy that's reflecting back. This is a rendering. You cannot tell the difference. It took me a while to tell the difference with my own team because they were playing a trick on me. This is a, a rendering that we've done for a facility. Um, this is about four or five years old. So we take technology, we put in some, some information, we create an environment, and, and I want to start with an image here about a rendering, and then we'll talk about a built project at the very end, how we're using technology to, to display some content. And some of this is uh, interactive with the touch. So I'll play a quick little demo for you to show you a bit of a rendering that we had done to create the concept for the client who couldn't visualize the space. city and it was in conceptual design for a facility they wanted sold. No working drawings, no schematics, no color schemes, nothing. A concept that we sat in our, in our uh, uh, innovation lab and we sat for a week and prepared it, sold on the concept. So using technology there's many many ways of saving what we spend a lot of which is paper. I'm going to rush to some of the front end stuff. We get quite involved with the industry. We're actually teaching a course now at BCIT on sustainability, and we've been invited in Alberta to do something similar. And we're speaking at the conference uh, for IES and the uh, quantity surveyors later on this year, where we're going to talk about the different green weighting systems and which green weighting system is more appropriate for you, because there's about 16 of them. If you don't know, it's not just LEED. There's 16 of them. And there are some that are, that are actually useful. This is an energy dashboard. So we went around and we wanted to track the amount of energy that we consume during the day. And we called every supplier in town and we wanted to buy their meters and we said, we'll pay for your software. 
And what they produced for us was ready-made stuff that displayed the information that they wanted us to see. Not the information we wanted to see. So we said, hell with this. We'll buy the parts, we'll buy the coding, and, and we coded our own software. So what you're looking at here is, on the left-hand side, the lighting being consumed. This is our office layout. Green means the lights are actually off, and the yellow is the lights are on right now. This is the amount of energy we're allowed to use, and this is what we're using. And we do the same for HVAC and receptacles, and we're down to 67% below the allowed code. And the way we do this is we've got integration with artificial intelligence through our office space. We have sensors peppered throughout the space and we pick up and the sensors actually learn based on how we interact with the sensors. So the iRobot movie that I played up at the beginning, that robot is, is learning human interaction and then modifying and adjusting to how it needs to react to the built environment. How many people here drive a car that you purchased since 2010? Majority of the room. Anybody drive a stick shift or it's all automatic? Stick shift. You notice how the clutch changes after a few weeks of driving it very aggressively? Or the grandma like driving, right? Very, very slow. And I use grandma because that's what my wife says. You're driving like a grandma. So when you drive very aggressively, the clutch actually depresses and grabs at the very end. So the very last 20% is when it starts grabbing. And when you start driving the way you're driving through the city and you're shifting and keeping it between second and third, because that's really as fast as you to go, the clutch pops up to allow for a full depression of the clutch. Well, how can a mechanical device adjust? We don't push a button for it to do that. It actually does it based on the way we interact with it. And that is what we use in our office to achieve the targets that we're talking about. Some of the other stuff I'll put up is photovoltaics, not to go into this too detail, but we're, we're doing installations as small as 15 kilowatts and as big as 600 kilowatts in Lower Mainland. So this is Vancouver Island and Lower Mainland. And to put it in perspective, when I spoke at uh, UBC when we did the SERS building about seven, eight years ago, uh, we were 10 to $11 a watt. Today we're at three. And, and the rate at which PV is going Give it two years, we're going to be at $1.50 to a dollar. And by comparison, if I was to compare that, today the cost of PV installed on a building is equivalent to oil at $15 a barrel. Which means the entire oil and energy sector is about to shut down in about seven to eight years. And there's an article on that in the Financial Post yesterday. I don't know if anybody's read it. Uh, and we'll talk about that very briefly. So VR and AR, we do quite a bit of it, and, and here's an example of, of the Lower Mainland. What we've done is place the model off the Lower Mainland, and we overlay some intelligence. This is uh, techie, geeky stuff for if I do this, this happens, and if I do that, that happens. It's a NAND and an OR gate system for the electrical folks in the room. And we use that to feed it some inputs, and the computer spits out an algorithm of some level of automation. Um, to, to convert that to the built environment, we then create the, scale, the, the, the shell and the skeleton of the building, working with the architects and the designers. And then we layer in where we want to see animation, whether it's lighting, whether it's the building, whether it's the facade changing reflection based on the exterior elements. So public art is a very big thing on projects in buildings or even on bridges and infrastructure. We can use the built environment to inform that. And that's what we do here and create uh, different patterns but this is not created by hand, and this is not created by us working through different options and iterations with groups of five committees, and you come up with this and we'll brainstorm, and about eight weeks later we come up with a sketch. This is done in six hours in our office, in our lab. So our innovation lab pumps this out in about four to six hours. And you're talking about all of that work up front that we would normally do, and either bill or not bill for, that we've now compressed down to less than a day's work by one person because we've integrated the technology to do that. And that's what's changed in our world. Uh, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Disruptive innovation. So we talked about disruption. So what's the definition of disruption? Everybody views it a little bit differently. You talked about opportunity. What's disruption to this group? I'll tell you my disruption. Mining laws show up. That's disruption. Uninvited, it's disruption. Not predicted, not expected, just showed up, my day is gone because I can't do what I planned I was going to do. 
That's disruption. And you take that and you modify it with any other form of work that we do, it's disruption. The next is technology. Everybody understands technology. Everybody has technology. You know, we worked with a client uh, a few weeks ago, we were having a meeting. And this client is still of the impression that lead is a fad and it's going to go away. And, and uh, we were joking and we were laughing, but they actually weren't joking and laughing. They were quite serious about it. So the adoption and the adoption curve is something we need to look at. Innovation is taking an idea and translating it into something that creates good value. And I think the folks at you spoke to that earlier as well. So you can look at technology as a disruptive measure, or you can look at it as an innovative measure. So everybody here at some form in life, and there's a lot of folks, I've been practicing since 93, so I've been working for 24 years. I've left things at the office. You leave your computer, you get home, you realize you left your computer at work. What do you do? Oh, well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. You left your book and your notepad and I left it at work. I left my business. I left something at work. No problem. Well, here's what we do now. You leave work. You get halfway home. Get over the bridge if you're crossing the bridges. You're almost home and you're looking around for it. Oh, crap. And what do you do? You turn around and we drive back to the office to get the one thing we cannot live with them, our smart device. Look at how we have changed in the lives we live. Our smart device has the equivalent value in our life of my three-year-old. Lose either and we're dead. <coughs> one you go to prison for, the other one you may not go to prison for. Uh, disruptive technology. It's basically anything that's innovative that displaces something that was there previously. That's all this is. And what we like to say is use the, dis use the technology to create a disruption that creates value for our customers. And a lot of the industry actually does not look at it that way. So the Rogers curve, and I'll put that up very briefly, everybody's seen this. The Apples of the world, they kind of live in that zone. Myself and, and, and our firm at AES, we actually live in that zone. We do a lot of work out here too, but we've got a group that actually specializes in that zone. We take a percentage of our revenue, throw it in the front end, and we call it the innovation lab, incubator, whatever you want to call it. And we brainstorm and do things, and we break things, and then we come up with new ideas. Uh, we can be bleeding edge or leading edge. And before, the difference in bleeding edge and leading edge used to be somebody that's just really out there. And this is kind of what's on the horizon. Today, this is not true. It's actually about a week apart. We have customers that we work with where every two to three weeks, their entire process is completely ancient. Could you imagine working in a business where every three weeks you're on your toes reinventing the business? And the business we are in, which is construction, we've actually been doing it the same way since we invented the chip, the, the chisel and the hammer, right? And all we're doing different now is rather than Recording information that way, we've got some computers, but we're still recording information in the same methodology. So why innovate? And what's the pitch? And why bother innovating? We can continue with business as usual or miss an opportunity. It's coming. And change is coming much, much faster than we think. Um, everything's online. Everybody has a smart device. And your smart devices can do more than your first computer you've ever had when you worked in your space. And for me, I get a new device every 6 to 12 months. Um, the reason we struggled, I unplugged my power supply, that uh, uh, nano tablet just showed up in my office two days ago, and I'm just using it. It's i7, 2 gigs, 16 gigs of RAM, it can cook your breakfast if you want. It's got no ports on it because it's supposed to be slim, and my favorite, it's only 3 pounds, right? So I can carry it anywhere I want. And I just replaced that with my last one about 12 months ago. So it's moving very, very, very fast. Everybody's seen Uber. I've got a slide on Uber further on. We'll talk about what's Uber's business model. And if I ask everybody, everybody will have 10 different answers. The biggest one is Uber is out to take away the taxi cabs. That's actually not their business model. It has nothing to do with what they're actually out to do. It is a step in the process, and we'll talk about that shortly. Moore's Law. Uh, I think we've all heard about it. Everything doubles, every two years things double, every two years things are changing. It's actually not two years anymore. It is six to nine months. 
Anybody heard or felt information overload, like this morning's presentation? <laughs> right? There's quite a bit of information. How many feeds do we have a day? Before I read the paper, I go have my coffee, have my latte, I get to the office, I get my emails, I get my feeds. I've got emails, I've got feeds, I've got my inbox, I've got my Teams, I've got Yammer, I've got Cloud, I've got... It's never ending. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. You've got to be on all these platforms if you want to hit all the audiences. And if you don't believe Snapchat is an audience, Snapchat is actually how McDonald's recruits all their staff. And right now, their retention rate is going like this. So, platforms are changing. And of course, everyone's seen something like this. I'm the big guy, I'm the dinosaur, I'm not going to change, nothing's going to happen, no need to change. And we've seen the demise of, of, of many industries. So, some of the recent trends. Um, if you've seen this, great. If you haven't, this is a factory in China. They replaced 650 employees down to 60 staff. And they brought in this guy. And it does everything. Absolutely everything. Other than even making the distinction is in what is right to do and what is wrong to do. It's actually happening much, much faster than we think it is. Uh, the other one, if you've got a smart TV at home, do not do pillow talk in front of your smart TV. And even if you think you've turned off the sensors, it's not off. It actually is not off. Um, we all have these, and we all have location tracking on our phones. So what do you do first thing? You turn off the location tracking, because I don't want it to track where I'm going and, and keep a tab on what I'm doing. You can turn it off. It's still on. And the reason it's still on is you have apps on this phone. As soon as you download an app, the app trumps every manual override you put on it. Because you give it full access to trump everything you put on it. So the TVs are actually recording everything that's happening around them. And the reason they do it, I've got a smart TV at home as well. And, and I do use the smart functions, right? Flick, change the channels, volume up. Uh, so all the signals you want to feed it, and it actually responds to that. And now what it does is adjust to what we do. So I get up at 3.55 in the morning, come downstairs, Make, keep my cup of tea, I'm on my couch, 3.59, the TV comes on automatically. Because it senses I'm sitting on the couch through the sensor that's on top of the TV. That's what it's for actually, not for taking pictures. It's for detecting that I'm actually there. 3.59, my TV's on automatically, and at 4.45 a.m., it's off. Right? If I've taken more than half hour, 40 minutes to do it, it just turns off automatically. That is artificial intelligence in our lives, and if we use it properly, it can actually help us propel. This is a, a, a recent company that started um, about a year into it now, Nautilus. Rather than using airplanes and trains to transport freight, we're using drones. And it's half the cost of a Boeing, no security issues other than clearing the FAA for flying, and the cost is, is uh, overall cost is, is about half to maybe 40%. But it's about 15 to 20 times faster than what we normally would do with train and freight and rail. So using technology, if you look at this, this is going to disrupt the trucking industry and the airline industry. And we've got some other examples going forward. This has a video as well, but I'm going to skip the video in the interest of time. This is a robotic garden that drives itself in search of the sun. So it's a spear, and it's got plants and vegetables, and it feeds a local community that it serves. And it just goes around the city and moves around and tries to find the sun and grows and at the end of the day it'll come back home. Could you imagine that? At some point in life buildings moving around? I mean that sounds crazy but a smaller form factor of, of, of anything can actually move. Because now rather than vehicles with, with people in them, we have computers that are transporting goods. Goods are anything. It could be the fins on your table, it could be individuals. Um, so the construction industry. And I think I have a few clips that I'm going to run through very quickly. Um, generative design. So in the design process, what we do is, is we take our repetitive work. Does anybody have repetitive work in their process, or is everybody innovating every morning? There is, repetitive, there is repetition in what we do. It doesn't matter. You're a carpenter, you're, you're setting up your day, you're doing form works, so you're pouring concrete, or you're building bridges and you're pouring in the basis of lights. There is repetition in everything we do. We actually take the repetitive nature of our business and what we do is we produce drawings. 
and the drawings are what then get built by, by some of the folks in this room. We automate some of the processes that take people hours and hours and hours of drawing time and, and figuring out the logistics. So you've got a room, this room has so many receptacles, this is a spacing, place them on a drawing, boom, boom, boom. We feed that in and automate that. So we can produce a room like that in about five minutes rather than drawing it, then the designer prints it, brings it over to me, I look at it, I redline mark it up and move it to where it goes, then it goes back to the system, back and forth about five times. We actually automate a lot of that so we can save time where we need to save time and then spend time where we need to spend more time. And where we need to spend more time is with our customers. Uh, some of the regenerative design that's used in our day-to-day -day lives is if you look at shoes, if you look at clothing, if you look at any sort of manufacturing, they use computer and computer technology to inform the built device that they're selling to you. Next one's a, a quick little video that I'll play for you which demonstrates. out, I'm giving it 2018. In our office, we're, 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 at, we're into it this summer. So we're completely on the VR and the AR side. This is a cool little clip that I'm going to put around uh, and run through very quickly. If you have a look around your offices, whether you're on a job site or not, look at the devices that you've got in your office. You've got computers, you've got TVs, you've got all sorts of stuff. 15, 20 years ago, we actually never had them. Going forward, in the next 5 to 10 years, and I'm you know, the slide is saying five to 10 years, I'll say two to six years. 2025 is kind of the outside of, of the next revolution. So if today anybody was to say, give me your smart device and continue functioning, we would say no. So 2025 will be the next one. And that's with autonomy, whether it's vehicles, whether it's buildings, whether it's infrastructure. Um, so look around and uh, you look at your car, there's no steering wheel. You have no way of, of maneuvering which way the car is gonna go. Why? Because you don't need one. You walk in and the car actually moves you around. We've seen a lot of these videos. If you've gone into CES or if you actually go to any of the new manufacturers, these are not concept vehicles, these are actual vehicles. Tesla's got it. BMW actually has it. You just don't know it. it's, it's part of the package that you're buying. Uh, these are the new designs and some of the autonomous vehicles that we're talking about. And I love autonomous vehicles. My three-year-old today, in, in 11 or 12 years, will have a driver's license. He won't be able to drive which is fantastic, because then I can call him home at 10 p.m. by the hit of a button, rather than waiting for him to show up at three in the morning, like I used to, right? So you run around the office, and you can't find your stuff, so you want to look for your keys. Where are your keys? I can't find them. So you run over, and you print yourself a new set of keys. I've got a 3D printer, I can print them. But hey, I actually don't need keys, because who cares about keys? My sensors, and the way I think, and the way I move, will guide everything around me. And if we don't think that's actually happening, when you walk into train systems, when you walk into highway systems, a lot of that detection that's happening on roads, in buildings. Uh, we have a customer, um, downtown Vancouver, without revealing the customer. He drives up to the parquet, and we know it's the customer, because we pick up the IP address on the phone, and then to confirm it's him and not his kid with his phone, we then do a license plate reader. And we pick up the license plate, we pick up the IP, the gate opens, they drive into the building, one by one the light comes on and then they drive down to their parking spot and then from there we bring down the elevator with destination dispatch, they walk into the elevator, walk up to the top floor, the lights come on and they walk into their office and it's good morning Peter. Blinds are up, the computer's up, lights on, air is on. That is not science fiction. That's a building we designed in 2009, opened in 2013. And the only difference is then it cost X amount of dollars for a sensor, today we can do it for five bucks. And the X amount used to be $500. It's now 5 to $7 for a sensor. 
Very, very cheap. Everything around us is sensored surroundings. If you've seen this where you can put a sensor on you to read your heart rate and all your vitals, you can now buy t-shirts. So you buy this t-shirt, you put it on, tie it to your Fitbit, and you do your exercise. And it takes all your vitals and tells you what you're doing, and then also sends it up to your doctor for any tracking that they need. So you don't need to sit in their office and physically sit there and run a treadmill for eight hours as they do their testing. So everything is changing very, very fast. Uh, again, more with the smartwatches. Um, and uh, uh, wearable technology, I think we're all familiar with. We're cloud computing. So at AES, our first office that we did in Victoria, we have servers. In Vancouver, we have servers. Calgary and Edmonton, we don't have servers. We use the cloud to do everything. The only time we have physical piece of devices when we're running a, a Revit model because it's so heavy, the cloud may slow down because we're not running uh, a fast enough connection. We're still 250 megs, we need to be gigabyte or 10 gig uh, before we get uh, the speeds that we want. I'm gonna skip through some of this just in the interest of time. Um, responsive environment, uh, for anybody in the room, these slides are about three years old on the next little bit. And I say that because when you look at it, you, some of you may or may never have seen this. We presented this to the staff at our office in 2015, um, where we can use devices to pick up face detection to unlock doors and get people in and out of buildings, whether it's your home, whether it's your car, or physical infrastructure. Uh, many devices that can feed and, and do things based on what you tell it. Sensored surroundings, I talked about it already. The TV reacts to what you do, the hotel Lighting reacts to what you do. Everything around you reacts to what you do. Have you heard of Hyperloop? Everybody's heard of the concept of Hyperloop? So I'm not going to get into Hyperloop too much. But I will talk about this one. This is the, anybody heard of the boring machine? And how real that boring machine is? Uh, it's, uh, I didn't think it was real. It's That's not going to take off because regulating the cars, the drones, and the airplanes is going to be a big mess, and there's no regulation that we can deal with once you cross the territory. So once you leave city of Vancouver, then what do you do? So the underground network is very, very real. Maybe not in Richmond, maybe not in Vancouver, but this is happening. And right now we've got a pilot of about 200 miles of track that's already been bored and dug up, and they're starting test runs on it. So. Um, the city that we will see this installed first will be Toronto. So Toronto, they've got uh, uh, Larry Page. If you know Larry Page, he's the head of Google. Um, he just, uh, they just purchased through Alphabet's company and through Sidewalk LLP, they purchased 12 acres of waterfront that they're gonna develop as the smartest city on the planet. And rather than doing it in the US, they're doing it in Canada. Why? Well, we're 30% cheaper with the dollar, so we're going to develop it there. So watch out, it's going to happen, and we're not talking about 10 years, likely 2018. Um, the video before this was Hyperloop. If you've seen Hyperloop, it's a similar concept, transporting people throughout. Um, Amazon Go. Anybody been to a store in Seattle? No? Oh, wow, this is super cool. You got a, you've got experience. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Now I look at this, and, and this is retail, this is grocery. Simon, we do buildings and infrastructure. Who cares? Well, you can do the same with people. 
We're now working with customers in hospitals and airports. A child goes missing. We can track him in 32 seconds. How fast do you want to find that child? Because every minute that goes by, there's a big, big problem. So we use detection, what they're wearing, their last description, where that person was, and then stop. They took off their jacket and the kid's running again. We now start the new scene and we go, boom, we pick up at this location in this building. These are the coordinates through GPS and we can track that person. So asset uh, uh, tracking, when we did Canada Post, we use RFID for tracking inventory in and out of the building. That's where this technology comes very, very handy. Now in our office, imagine our AES office where we can track all of our individuals coming in and out. And not because I want to see their productivity or, or, or fingers on the, on the keyboard. It's about utilization of space. Do we go and buy the six more pods of computers and, and workstation? Actually, no. Based on this algorithm, this workstation is never used from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pair up those three movies around them. I don't need to get another 2,000 square, of, square feet of office space. I can actually use my existing space for exactly what I need. We are doing that right now in our office because we ran out of space and we maxed out. And rather than leaving the office, we're now doing this to put alternate bums in seats. Talk about the real estate industry changing drastically. Uh, next one is drones and flying. I'm not going to play this video. I think we've seen it. Has anybody been to Lowe's and seen an Oshbot? Has anybody been to Lowe's or Home Depot? Have you been to it in the States and seen an Oshbot? No? Oh, you guys see this. I just know. I, I'm a. She's not in the, um, uh, on the construction side. So I can send her in, here's a screw, take it in, you place it in front, and I'll take you exactly to where it is, and then I can pick it up, scan it right there, I don't stand cashier lineups, and then off, I leave the building. Right now in Silicon Valley and in California, we are talking about warehouses and distribution centers that have zero employees. So imagine Amethyst Island in Lower Mainland, no employees. No drivers, no trucks, nothing that is manually operated. It comes in, everything is automated, robots are dealing with it, we get them on containers, and then there's an accident on, 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 or a traffic jam on um, uh, Nordell Way or Nordell uh, uh, Bridge or any other infrastructure that we have, pop it on a drone, ship it over, and send it where you want to. That's actually the way business gets done in the southern US and some parts of Chicago and other parts of the world as well. And the third world countries are actually adopting it much, much faster than we are because they're skipping it. You ever go to a third world city? You go to Mexico, you go to the Caribbean, you go to India, China, you go anywhere else. There's one thing that they have. They don't have water. They might not have clean water or clean supplies or a clean head of lettuce. But they have one thing that we just started buying five years ago. They've got a smartphone. They don't even have landlines. There's no landlines. We skipped that whole generation of landlines straight to mobile. My uncle, he's the last family member that lives in India. It's husband, wife, and three kids. They have 24 devices. Why, I don't know, but apparently we'll find out. So moving forward, we can't do, and this is something I preach all the time in our office, we cannot do tomorrow's task with today's tools and yesterday's approach. In our business, in our industry, it's not about the tools and the lack thereof in our business, it's the approach. We are stuck in this method of doing it the way we've always done it and have 30 to 50% waste in our business, starting with the owner with an idea and where we see it. The owner has an idea and they transform it with, with uh, consultants into uh, spec sheets and room data sheets. How is that done? Manually. Architect gets those room data sheets and then we convert it into a 3D drawing. We built it the 3D model, but we focus on things that are not as important. Then the engineers get involved. There's no intelligence in the model because it just looks good. We've done the, the pretty aspects first. So we build our own models. Then we get the contractor coming. Can you build what we've designed? Well, your model isn't even coordinated. We're going to build our own model. So then they build their own model. And then the people come to the job sites that are going to start construction and they go, model, where's my hammer? I'm going to build it my way. We've actually 
actually done projects recently where we shipped out a BIM model with a hollow lens, and we, we've created this, you know, they can see the object, they can spin around, they can walk through it, and then they go back and they want IFC drawings, five sets, 36 by 48, so they can lay it on the drafting table, because that's the way I did it, that's the way I was trained, and that's the way we're gonna do it. That's the problem in our industry, it's the approach. And we'll talk about how some of it has to change. You see this self-driving trucks? So Auto came up with this and they just sold, not just, they sold last year for $680 million to Uber, and Uber is now piloting self-driving trucks. And these are on the road in California, in case you want to see one, they're always around. There's a guy sitting on the back and he's reading a book, <laughs> hands off the wheel, and it's just motoring along. No congestion, no accidents, it'll actually slow down 10 kilometers or 10 miles an hour in a head of congestion so that it doesn't come to a full stop and then start up, right? All autonomous. Uh, this is a quick little video, I won't play in the interest of time. It's using drones in Rwanda. Anybody been to Rwanda in Africa? It's a very poor country, they have no roads, they have no way of getting from one end to the other. And to go from one end of the country to the other, or going from the middle to any other part, you're going over hills and mountains. So when there's an injury, when somebody gets sick, they need blood, they need plasma, they need supplies coming in, and usually it takes days or hours or weeks to supply it. And by then the patient is no longer. Now what we use is drones. So we use drones to deliver any package that you want within 10 minutes. Rwandan doctors stranded without vital blood supplies will soon be helped by an important new ally in their fight to save lives, drone deliveries. Robotics company Zipline has started using drones to deliver blood to far-flung clinics in the East African nation dubbed the Land of a Thousand Hills. So, do we need to build the roads? Do we need to build the bridges? Do we need to build the highways? Do we need to build the infrastructure to get there? No. Nope. Absolutely not. Save all that money, move it into tech, and find a different way of deploying it. They're doing it in every part of the world, and we are still pouring concrete, pouring it in place, waiting for it to do stuff, and of course we have concrete in Vancouver, and steel in Seattle. We're same seismic zone, I don't know why we do that, but we do it anyways. This is a uh, construction, so linemen operators, high voltage. I don't want to be them. I used to be a contractor, I, I was a contractor for uh, uh, seven years and then I got into engineering, so that's, that's my background. I don't want to do what he's doing, I really don't want to do what any of them are doing. And they're all done through linemen. And now what we're doing is debris on high voltage lines. In China they use flamethrowing drones. Get rid of the debris. <laughs> right? So you drive downtown Vancouver after, not Friday night, Saturday night for sure. On a Monday morning you come into work, you always see the shoes hung over the lines, so they don't put linemen and stop traffic to fix this. Drones going, blast it, fry it, it's done. So we replace all those linemen that are doing that stuff and we don't stop traffic. Traffic continues. So this is many, many things that are changing. Uh, we want to replace an arrestor, we want to replace anything on, on uh, lines and they're looking at using drones to do it. Any heavy equipment, it's still human being, but anything else, we're looking at drones. So a lot of, lot of the industry that are looking for a high voltage linemen, or just linemen in general, they will stop looking for them pretty soon. Uh, Wind Sun Decorating, so this is a company in China that does uh, prefab homes, if you haven't heard. 10 homes in a day, uh, they did 100,000 square foot or 10,000 square meter office building, which is their head office, in a month. You want to do a 100,000 square foot office building in Vancouver, minus the permits. It's two years, with permits it's 12, we get that. Calgary is 15, if it makes you feel any better. Uh, we do everything either inside factories or we assemble at destination. And we're looking at 5,000 US dollars for a single family dwelling of 2,000 square feet. You can remove and solve all the homeless problems in Vancouver by just doing that instead of what we are doing right now. Like talk about the power of tech and moving the, the, the uh, industry ahead. So. Mortgage industry, how do you finance a home that's built for 5,000 bucks? That can actually be torn down within seven years, recycled and rebuilt again. How do you finance that? How do you mortgage that? And then it's all non-flammable. What do you need insurance for? If it floods, build a new one. If it breaks down, build a new one. It's never gonna catch on fire. And it costs the same or cheaper to build new than to repair. And in our industry now, it's cheaper to repair than to build new completely backwards. 
Uh, famous lines, I put them out, and the last one is the one I like the most. The internet will collapse in 1996. So for any of the experts in the rooms, or any of the experts that you speak with, be careful of the expert advice. And I always lean to the S-curve. And the S-curve is the point at which you take off. Right now, for smartphones, we're here. Market share. Every single person I know, their grandma has a smartphone. And they communicate with them by texting. That's just how it happens. Nobody calls anybody anymore. And we're talking about autonomous in the building side, where it's going to be taken off right about here over the next two, three years. Buildings or infrastructure. So when we do roadways, we're now doing light bollards with intelligent Wi-Fi beacons and cameras and everything built in. So we can pick up the cars, we can pick up the human beings, we can pick up any asset that's moving through, whether it's a bridge, a building, a compound, or a structure. We are actually doing that on our projects, and it's very doable. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this, but these are not possibilities. Anybody that owns a Tesla, this is actually real. You're actually looking at these graphics out of your vehicle. Tesla, BMW, Mercedes, uh, Audi, they're all able to present this level of diagnostics. As soon as you come home, they'll tell you what's wrong with your car, if there is anything wrong with it. So back to Uber. We talked about Uber, and I think everybody thinks that Uber is this. <laughs> right? I've got a... We've got four uncles from my wife's side of the family that own cabs. We start talking about Uber, and I leave the room or I go home. It's not a discussion that I find pleasant at all. But Uber is actually not here to disrupt the taxi industry. What is Uber's business model? For anybody that's interested or, or maybe aware. Uber's business model is to have autonomous vehicles without owning a vehicle. Uber is going to disrupt GM, Ford, and all the big three manufacturers in the United States. That's their business model. So who starts a business with saying, I'm gonna take out the biggest company on the planet? Very, very gutsy. This is not what they're doing. They're actually doing this. This without owning the vehicles. You actually don't need to own the vehicles. And now, so this is a disruptor. We talked about disruptors. Uber is now getting disrupted. If you haven't heard, GM just bought out two other companies and Ford just invested a billion dollars in YAML. YAML and Lyft are competition of Uber. They just now joint venture and their goal is to take Uber out. And what they're doing is they're going through federal legislation and saying, how can you have autonomous vehicles if you don't have anybody that owns them? Because GM is trying to protect their platform. <coughs> So they're saying, if you don't own a car, you can't let it be on the road. So they're actually trying to take out Uber. So the disruptor that's out there to kill everybody's jobs is now getting killed. And this is all in a span of three to four years. So it is moving very, very, very fast, and there's no time to wait. This is an article that came out yesterday. If you've seen it, you understand what I talked about earlier. All fossil fuel vehicles will vanish in eight years. And this is not a, a, a myth or something that somebody put up there. This is actually should be taken very, very seriously. Because when, when you look at the battery technology and the cost of battery and solar and how it's going down to being cheaper than producing a gasoline-powered vehicle. In case you didn't hear that, I'll repeat that. It is cheaper to produce an electric car than a combustible engine vehicle. And that is now what's going to destroy the oil sector. So construction, we'll talk about construction and the construction industry. And this is a report put up by McKin McKinsey and Company. It's available, it's publicly, uh, I just picked them as one. There's about 30 different articles on it. And they go around the globe and, and look at things and predict it. And by the way, McKinsey also was hired to help um, um, AT&T predict the uh, mobile device market decades ago. And what they predicted was 1% of what actually happened. So don't always look at these reports, look at, apply your own judgment, but for the sake of the construction industry, I think they're bang on. Um, we take 20 to 30% in waste, we're always over budget, there's little to no innovation. Uh, at our firm, we spend 1% to 2% of our revenue and throw it in the innovation incubator, and then we work through it. I don't think many firms do that. Um, and what innovation means to different people are different. 
So here's a picture of construction um, or the industry in automotive. So if you look at the automotive industry from when it was before, and this is what we have now. Completely automated with robots. Have a look at our industry. It looks exactly the same, just black and white to color. There's no difference. That's how we did drawings. I never did that, I don't remember. But some people had the electric erasers and, and did drawings that way. That's how we do drawings today. It's exactly the same thing. This guy's lying on the ground, could have had a scotch. You're sitting on the computer, you could still have a scotch. <laughs> Boring, mundane, repetitive. And the reason, in my opinion, that our construction industry is not changing, we have a mismatch of the economic drivers. Every other industry rewards innovation. The construction industry does not reward innovation. We do it because, well, we're crazy and, and I love tech. Um, if you look at the AEC community, we want more time to do the job, we want more billable hours so we can make money and build a customer, and then we want more time to design it and the contractors want more time to build it. I don't think I've said anything there that's inappropriate. Here's what the owner wants. Less time, low cost, less people, do more with less. And there's the owner paying, and this is us receiving. Our economic cycles are completely not aligned. That's why we're not innovating in this industry. And if you look at the study, everybody's seen this, always 20% or 20 months of delay, 80% of it is, is over budget and delayed and so many things. And these are on industrial projects, not commercial. Commercial doesn't see that big number, uh, much, much smaller. And if you look at any of the industry, this is construction on innovation. Red means you're behind the times. Relatively low on, on the digital uh, world. If you look at the rest, oil and gas, manufacturing, media, ICT sector, they're all advanced. They have to be, that's their business. So this business is lagging quite a bit. And I think there's about four or five reasons that these guys have put up. I have about seven or eight, but I've used their article for the purpose of this. First one is high definition surveying and geolocation. When we do a survey now, what do we do? We send people to the site, whether you're surveying a road or a building or a street or mechanical electrical systems in a building, and they survey it. What we do, we put a little radar in there and it uses LiDAR technology, scans a whole room, produces a BIM model, you're done in four hours. It replaces about two weeks of work within a built environment. Next one, 5D. If we talk about 3D BIM, I'm going to talk about 5D BIM. Digital collaboration, Internet of Things, and, and the future-proof design. So the first one is, is uh, 3D laser scanning, UAV, and LiDAR. So LiDAR is, uh, if you've got a vehicle and you put it in cruise control, so any, everybody that's bought a vehicle in the last uh, five to seven years, you put the car in cruise control at 100 kilometers an hour, you get on the highway, you get it to about 100 kilometers an hour on, on highway number one for about you know, three minutes. And then automatically it slows down and it ramps up and you can adjust how many car lengths you want in front of you. Some of you are an audience, so you know what I'm talking about. That's autonomous vehicles. I use it all the time. I get on the highway, the only thing I'm doing is steering. I'm not speeding up, I'm not doing anything. I stay in one lane, in the HOV lane, it just takes me where I'm going, I'm steering. And my car is 2011. If I buy the 2017 BMW, I can actually let go of the steering wheel. And it'll do it for me. And I'm comfortable doing that. So that technology introduced into uh, the construction world is something we need to look at. And I notice this is in the way. Um, 5D. So 5D is 3D that we do in design, but then we layer in schedule and we layer in budget. And every contractor on the planet has been saying it forever, we have to just do this. Let's just stop with the 3D design and the 2D visualization and we've just got to get to the 5D. Because without schedule and without budget, you might as well not even do it. Because you can't build it if you're over budget. And we're always over budget. Uh, digital means and software and apps. So using the apps instead of paper. We got a contract and a commission for a project that but as if you were, were, were surveying all the underground utilities and manholes and so on. All we did is we took their GIS, we imported it into a tablet, we wrote an app. You see, when we can't find it on the internet, we just go and write it. So we wrote an app and now our guys just take that tablet and they hold it over everything. They come back and they've got all the intelligence you can possibly need which would normally take you two months to survey. So that's what needs to change. 
Sensors, this is Internet of Things, and then off-site construction. So this is constructing and building off-site and then coming on-site and assembly. So has anybody seen these? And we've got a few more slides and then we'll wrap up, um, get you out of here before night. Has anybody seen this? And what am I pointing at in the picture? Sorry? The green and red lights. What are the green and red lights? Stone available or not. A stall available or not. So, if you are installing these in your buildings, you might as well stop because you're going to waste your money. And you already have wasted your money. These costs, how much do these cost? 50000 to about a few million bucks, depending on the building you're putting them in. Do not put them in. You don't need them. Of course, you want to know why, right? Why am I just saying this? Why don't we need these sensors? If you bought a vehicle since 2010, I've got a 2011 5 Series BMW, it comes with sensors on it. Parking sensors, backup sensors, and it's got this, you put it in reverse, and it's got the top view of the vehicle. That's how the LiDAR technology is used to make sure you don't hit the car in front of you in cruise control. You know what the car is doing when you're driving? Those sensors are capturing, so I'm in a parking lot, and those are parking stalls. I'm driving, and my LiDAR technology is capturing if a stall is empty or occupied. And all of that is being streamed from your vehicle up to the manufacturer, and then they are selling it to the retail giants for them to deploy this to figure out if I need 700 stalls of parking or 1,500 stalls of parking. And your car is doing it, you have signed the permission on it, because when you bought the car, you have declared, I give you full rights to do whatever you want with my data. Tesla's doing it, Audi's doing it, every vehicle manufacturer is doing it. So when we design parking lots and parking lot controllers, we don't need them anymore. You just have license plate reader and your smart device, and we use your car technology, and the city that's going to be built in Toronto, that's the way it's going to be built. Your vehicles will be used as sensors to pick up anything that we want. So we don't need to go ahead and install additional sensors, we just take that information and that data from the car manufacturers and then use that to inform our built environment. Super, super cool. I think at least. Uh, the next one. Anybody been to a mine? I worked in forestry, so before I came to buildings, I did three years up in a chasm. And if you don't know, it's minus too much up there and never really pleasant. It's actually a chasm uh, north of 100 Mile House. Um, this is a, a truck, and I'll show you the advantage of it. It was just released earlier this year, and they've already back ordered for the next three years. mine 24 hours, nothing breaks down, nobody needs a coffee break or take vacation. Right? It all happens automatically. In our built world, have a look at this one. Uh, oh, there we go. This is a 77 apartment building, 77 unit, six story apartment building that we put up in about 10 days. All compartmentalized containers, shipping container concept. And we're doing these on projects right now for hotels, where we're building the hotel modules, building the core, popping in the modules, and the modules are all pre-done. So all we're doing is quick connects, modular construction. Um, the next one is uh, um, construction, similar concept. We've got a building that we're able to put up very quickly. I don't know if you 
saw that one stat. Three floors a day. How many people pour concrete here? Or build buildings? Three floors a day. We do a floor a week in Vancouver. That's the going rate. With the rain. Without the rain, we can do it every three to four days. Uh, anybody had sound? So if you're a bricklayer, <laughs> watch that. Uh, bricklaying costs anywhere from 35 to 50 cents a brick. Instead of 40 or 35 to 50 cents a brick, Sam is 4 cents a brick. 4 cents versus 45 to 50 cents, and it runs 24 hours. The Toronto City I already talked about. Have you heard of self healing concrete? You pour concrete, and over a 100 year span, it will heal itself. If it cracks, it wears, if there's water spill, this is coming out. It's, it's been tested, and it's now going to be uh, there's a project that they're going to test it on in the US as well where it completely heals and the cracks are completely gone, it stays sweet. And I'm almost frozen. The very last video that I'll play for you, and then we'll wrap it up in a minute here, is the HoloLens. Actually, I've already talked about HoloLens technology. The very last video that I'll play for you is a built environment that we've done using the um, modeling that we showed you at the beginning of the PowerPoint. product and with two minutes left any questions if not thank you I've got to believe there must be questions I know Matt doesn't understand half of this like me <laughs> any questions just out of interest there's a lot of tech here, but you know, I, I work for a large-ish, mid-sized firm. We're living in the dark ages technology-wise. But how do you see your traditional engineering firm being disrupted? Wow, good question. Okay, so traditional is a... Um, yeah, standard fee-for-service. The, 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 the challenge with technology, the way it's viewed, is it, it's kind of like... And I was, mentioning this to yourself as well. If you look at our, our bodies and you look at the way we are designed, you get a little bit of bacteria in you, and, and if your immune system kicks in, it fights it. If it doesn't, you've got a cold or flu, right? So your immune system kicks in automatically. I've worked for a very, very large firm, uh, five-figure in employees and, and public, and I've worked for a medium-sized firm in the hundreds. Um, and, and in larger firms, what happens is the immune system's kicking, and any change to process is cut and kicked out. Um, so what we've done at our firm is, is um, I'm the immune system, so I control what we want to cut and not cut. And we've got a lot of genius minds in our office, with, with mainly the younger staff that come in with ideas, and we let them come up with the ideas. How we see our business being disrupted is the creation of the idea to a 2D, to then back to 3D, to sequentially passing information to everybody, is all going to change and convert to take your concept, Put the concept in the image and everybody participates at the same time, in the same space. And what we're doing is taking that drawing and schematic level exploration and all of that's cut out. 
we may still get into working drawings beyond the concept and the schematic and design development, but all that front end is going to go. And we waste and spend a lot of time in that. Um, and by improving that, then we can save on the CDs, and if we can get the construction association to, to wrap up as well, which they are, some, some builders are quite innovative, they actually use their own uh, methods of deploying and finding class detections, not just beams, but other things. Um, we'll see a lot of this change drastically, which means a lot of the senior, intermediate, junior staffing approach of somebody does the design and somebody does the work and somebody does the drawings, that's going to go. It's going to be senior and intermediate. So you're wrapping up really quickly and you're participating actively and you need that experience right away. That's what we see and we have one project we're working on right now uh, where we're trying that out on. It's about a $50 million job. Okay. One yes? Of, one of the issues that I've seen is like, we're in this world where everything's bespoke, everything's custom. You know, Pre-purchase, pre, pre pre-sale, what finishes do you want? So when you get into prefab and modular, that needs to go. So like our expectations need to just be thrown out and that's the building you're getting because every building that everyone, every project everyone work is working on is a bloody prototype. Yeah. So and that's what's grim in the construction industry for the last hundred years is everything's new all the time even though it's needed. So it's continuous innovation in areas that absolutely don't require it. Here's something that we're all very tolerant to. I run an Android. How many people in this room run an iPhone? Okay. Do you know you cannot do anything with the iPhone? My Android can scream to anything in this building. I can open protocols, stick in a USB, get anything I want. I'm completely free. Apple is Apple Planet. That converts to iTunes. That I need a physical connection to a computer. Blah, blah, blah. There's so many restrictions. We've accepted that. So we, we've learned to accept things by massive. Because the rest of the world has done it. In our business, we continue to innovate in little things that serve little to no value, which I think is your point, because it's, it's wasting time. But when everybody else around us stops doing it, then we will be forced to change. And the construction industry that we're talking about, we're talking about building 10,000 homes in a week in Africa. India right now, the slums, the slums are being revitalized where we're taking 10 by 10 containers, popping them in, they're all pre-done. So, those are not the custom. The custom is focused towards the guy that's building his custom palace or whatever. So that industry is shifting. We're still trying to customize uh, the wall socket and, and integrate it with, with where the HVAC is going to go. We need to change that. And that only starts with us. And so we're doing it in our firm, but, but that's where it needs to start. And the industry is a little bit behind. There was another question here. Oh. Thank you. Um, that was tremendous. Thank you, Sonny. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, so how do you see as resolving that intractable problem of the misaligned economic incentives between the owner and the industry? That's, that's, that's because the that's building, the heart of it, right? That's the billion dollar question. How do we fix the economics so that it is something that the industry will just be forced to do? And the answer to that is um, the technology is scaling up so fast our traditional means of economic rewards around oil and sectors that used to be traditional are actually going to disappear. So when that happens, we will be forced to do it. If you're ahead of it, you're working with the owner and you're changing the economic model right now, there's people that are going to be impediments around that. And what we're trying to do is get on and get started. And if you're really going to drag your heels, you're just going to be left behind. Um, it's happening in all parts of the world except North America. If you travel to Europe and travel to anywhere else in, in the Middle East or in, or in the third world countries I refer to, they're actually what is going to push us. Because they will not need half the stuff we make. Half the stuff that we are making will actually not be required by 2018. I'm saying 18 because that is the year. Everything is going to change because of the cost model of supply and demand of battery and, and solar compared to oil. Oil and gas is not going to be what it is and it's actually going to get worse before, it'll never get better. Yes? Just coming to that point, uh, where do you see Vancouver in multi-story uh, construction industry to get to the net zero, net positive level uh, with the declination of solar and not the, like it's not available in Vancouver or Victoria. So where do you see that? Because um, 
So the question is around solar and how do you see going net zero and so on. Uh, what, about the build, multi-story buildings like you did in Kelowna. Yep. Or, so. So, so the confusion around solar is we need sun for solar to work. That's actually incorrect. Solar technology doesn't work on sun. So when you're doing radiant piping on top of a building, it uses the sunlight to heat the water in there. Whereas solar photovoltaic arrays work on radiation. So on a cloudy day, we still get radiation. You may not get as much. What is happening in the solar industry is it used to be 10 to 17% efficient on the cell and on the panel itself. It's approaching 20 to 30, yeah. which means you've doubled the production. And now that the cost is coming down, we're able to install it on projects and achieve more towards net zero. The struggle is I need my room to be 18 degrees C. And my data center has to be 22 degrees C at the rack. And the actual computers, for example, in the data center, the computers are designed for 87 degrees ambient. Now somebody asked me, is that Celsius or Fahrenheit? It's actually designed for 87 degrees C. And we cool a data center to 18 degrees because somebody said we have to do it. Completely, completely wrong. You can do free air cooling. So until we change that approach, we will never hit that net zero question that you talked about. Any other questions? Yes? Okay, that's the last one. So that's the last one? Okay. okay. I got the that's fine. How do you view the issues of cross platform compatibility when it comes to technology? Um, using especially with the rapid pace that you mentioned, the development of technology, how do we address that and how does it be working across the board? So the question is cross platform and proprietary networks. So uh, we actually follow Elon's model. Nothing in our office is proprietary. Anybody wants it, take it. We'll give it up. It's our secret sauce, take it. And that is actually how this is going to work. So Tesla has now opened everything about two years ago, and everything they develop is open platform. Google's done the same. So a lot of these technologies that are still holding on to my proprietary and my this, and you'll buy my software for the next 30 years, they're going to be extinct in five years. 2022, they'll be extinct. Don't count on it. It is going to be open source protocol because you're manufacturing a car, you're doing a building, you're doing retail, you're doing something else. We'll take all of your data, put it together, do the integration, and then deploy a system. And then when we're gone, somebody else wants to come and tinker with it, they can. So that, that holding on to proprietary thing, it's, it's done. It is so done. And then people that don't understand that. I'm here for more questions if anybody has afterwards, but I think I got the hook, so I've got to get off the stage. Yes. Yes.